I invite those persons who are outside to come in and join us. I invite you to stand at this time, if you can. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God I myself will see him with my own eyes I and not another the Lord redeemed his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. God is our refuge and strength. As ever present help in trouble. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house. There are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. to heaven. So we are going to sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord of life and death, who by your mighty power this raise up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Draw near to us, now we pray, O Lord, and comfort us with your presence and your peace. Help us to listen and to take heart to your word. Lord, we remember with gratitude and thanksgiving the one whose earthly life is now ended. Enable us to worship you with submissive and thankful hearts. Lord, we lift up our sorrows and our hope to thee. And Lord God, we know that you will give us peace. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome you this morning to this Thanksgiving service. I know hearts are broken even now, but the Lord is our refuge and strength. The scripture reading will come to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 50 to 58 and this will be done by daniel francis grandat We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. May the Lord add his blessings to these words. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. The tributes will be coming to us from the following persons, and you will come respectively. Mrs. Susan Hamilton, daughter. Miss Nicole Harris, family friend. Mrs. Shereen Hills Bennett, church representative. They'll come in that order. Morning, church. Morning. I wrote this tribute for my mother. I loved my mother dearly, although I had some doubts in my early years, especially when the strap would sing and shout but she loved me first 
and showed me how much she cared. I remember the many times we spoke of how she used the rod and oh yes, it spoke. I remember the many rescues and of this my brother Delroy can confirm. The many times he took those licks when upon me they would rain. Spare not the rod and spoil the child and that my siblings and I knew and could quote very well. But it was all for our good to teach us the way to go. My mother loved unconditionally and shared her love the best way she knew how. I will cherish those memories we shared, those laughs and hugs and counsels too. I'll miss them so much, those birthdays, those dinners and get-togethers will never be the same. I miss those birthday puddings that she knew I loved so much. Your finger look, licking cooking, yes, you were one of the best. Whenever I would visit her, my friends from school, from work, or from church, she knew so many of them by name. So often she would ask me, how so-and-so is doing? And I would look at her and remark, how did you remember that person's name? We would laugh and I would say, your memory is very sharp. My mother's love, I did not doubt, especially with each passing year. As I grew up and became a mother myself, her wisdom I could understand and likewise better appreciate her. I see her in the way I live and know that she was proud of the woman that I have become. And that helps me to go on, to love, to live, and to sing. There are so much more things I would like to say, but for now I'll leave it there. And know that you are okay now as you rest from all your cares. You are my confidant and friend until the very end. I'm glad I could spend that last day with you and hold your hand and sing to you and remind you that Jesus cares. I thank God I was there. You fought long and hard and I wish you were still here but I know that God loves you best and so I must accept that this is not goodbye but just a temporary pause. I'll carry on with these memories forever in my heart. I love you, Mom, and will forever hold you dear. I pray that we will meet again on that happy, glorious day. Is Miss Nicole Harris here? If not, then Mrs. Shereen Hillsbenes, the church representative, Sister Shereen, will come to us. Good morning, church. Revelation 13, 14, verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. This verse best describes Sister Jean Brown's legacy. In 1998, Sister Jean Brown transferred her membership from the Mount Nebo Baptist Church 
to the Ebony Vale Baptist Church in which you're sitting this morning, being the Proverbs 34, 31 woman as she was, she wasted no time in being a part of the church's choir, the Women's Federation, the Family Bible Hour, as well as a part of the street feeding program. She listed her preferred areas of ministry as singing on the choir and cooking for social events, which she did until she could no longer do so. When she enjoyed the worship experience, she would express this with mimic, Mwah! That is how she would express how good the service was. If you sang and it was good, she would say, Mwah! So that was how she expressed how good services were. She was so ardent that during the time she was unable to physically be present in the sanctuary, she would join online and she could regurgitate all the events that took place. During this time, she was also eager to have her tithes and offering be submitted to the church. A common thread in all the tributes received from the different groups that were mentioned before and others are a perpetual smile, a generous giver, an excellent cook and baker, and each group ascribe the following. From the Women's Federation, the tributes were like a kind-natured person with a quiet presence, a big contributor of quality farm products and sumptuous baked, baked products as well, particularly potato pudding. Loving, caring, yet firm honest about her ability to do things in and for the church. She gave generously in cash and kind. She was a calm and gentle soul. She made you always feel that you were a sister to her. She was pleasant and she encourages you to do your best. Some of them even mentioned the rural runs which were trips to die for. From the street feeding program, even though she was rostered to cook one Sunday of every month, she would wait in line just in case there was someone who was not able to fill in for their day. She would cook part, she would come to church, and many days she would say, by the time I get home, Delroy finished the food for me, and I was just ready to serve. As a choir member, her peers saw her as unpretentious, shy, devout, and possessed a crystal clear soprano voice, which she projected with a wishful quality and earnestness. She displayed high level of dedication, commitment, and was faithful and punctual. With her perpetual smile, and effervescent personality, Brother Matthew had a hard time in getting her to have the tall sound because she would smile. And so he had that much of a challenge to get her having that tall sound. No pain was ever too severe to stop her from coming to rehearsals. The only thing that stopped her from coming was the incapacitation that she, that she endured post-surgery. In 2021, the choir thought it was opt on the death of her husband to give her a poinsettia, and her comment was, if you had given me a million dollars, I couldn't be more happy. And she continued. Mr. Brown would always give me one of these at Christmas time, and I would watch it until the last leaf has left. Her family Bible hour teacher says that she was ardent and participated fully. 
She would always read her Bible and express her thoughts on what she thought the scripture meant. As a part of class 12, Class activities were near and dear to the hearts of the Browns. She was a huge supporter. She would not hesitate to open our doors to accommodate us, as well as the neighbors, for cottage meetings, where we had robust Bible discussions, testimony nights, lustly singing, where you could depend on her melodious voice as she knew all the songs. At harvest, our class would be the envy of all other classes because she made sure that we had the largest display of ground provisions. Persons queued up in the church from Saturday night to mark their names on the canes so that they wouldn't be sold, but that didn't stop persons from buying them even after they were identified as somebody else's. Food was not the only thing, but our class had a set amount to give for each harvest. And notwithstanding her giving her best out of the field, she would still make sure that her monetary gift was what was set by the class. I think I only became the head of that class mainly because of the bronze. Sister Brown was also integral in our chicken rearing project for the class. She reared the chicken and she plucked and did all that was necessary and most of it was sold to the members of this church. We also had a cake sale for our class, and she was so instrumental. There was nothing that we did in the class that she took a back seat. That was who Sister Brown is. Personally, strength, courage, and endurance are but just a few of the characteristics that I have observed in Sister Jean Brown. The smile that could warm the heart of a rat bat. When I openly expressed my love for her, she would reply, I know you do, because you show it, and I love you as well. Sister Brown, is missed from the choir. She's missed from every ministry of this church that she was a part of. And there's no one who has come in contact with Sister Brown who is not deeply impacted by her passing. May her soul rest in peace. May our soul rest in peace. Is Mrs. Harris, Miss Nicole Harris here? All right. If not, then we will do the offertory hymn, which is There's a Land Beyond the River. to come and let us give thanks for what you will give to the service of the Lord. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you, Lord,
for who you are. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us so that today, God, we can share this blessing. And so, God, lead as you seek best, even in our giving. Amen. Camille Francis, the daughter of Sister Brown, will come to us with the eulogy, after which we'll have the selection from the Ebonville Choir, and then our pastor, Reverend O'Neill Brown, as you see him seated there, Reverend Brown, will come to us with the sermon. Friends and family, today we gather to remember and honor the remarkable life of a woman who truly made a difference in this world. She was a devoted wife, 
and mother, a compassionate humanitarian, and an inspiration to all who knew her. She was an unforgettable individual who was hardworking, thoughtful, fun-loving. She was also known as a woman of integrity, compassion, humor, and love. She was affectionately called Mrs. Brown, Sister Brown, Jean Brown, Jean, Paddy, Paddyfoot, Mama, Mommy, and Grandma. She was born at home to a fellow Paddyfoot and Adina Davis on March 19, 1950, in Jeffreytown, St. Mary. She was the second child for her mother and the first for her father. She attended Wallingford All Aid School in her early years. She loved attending school and had a great time playing dandy shandy, jacks, and skipping with her schoolmates. Her favorite teacher was Miss McFarlane, as she was very caring not only to her, but also to her other siblings. In 1969, Jean met Kenneth, and they got married eight years later, on July 16, 1977. In July of 2021, they celebrated their 44th wedding anniversary, and their love for each other grew stronger with each passing year. Jean is survived by her mother, Adina, four children, Delroy, George, Camille, and Suzanne, seven stepchildren, Yvonne, Conrad, Denise, Oliver, Tamika, Kelisa, and Sian, as well as another child who is just as close as her own children, Byron, She's also survived by nine grandchildren, two great-grandchildren, and eight siblings, as two predeceased her. She was a wonderful mother who took parenting seriously. She taught us the principles of hard work, honesty, integrity, the importance of education, how to be resourceful, independent, and not forgetting to be God-fearing. She was a disciplinar disciplinarian and was not afraid to mete out that punishment as she saw fit. She also taught us the importance of family, being loving and kind to each other, and how to extend that compassion to those around us and to the less fortunate. Jean was very active in the Mount Nebo Baptist Church for many years and later Ebony Vale Baptist Church after she moved to Spanish Town. She devoted many years to the homeless in Spanish Town in helping to feed them as an active participant at the Ebenyville Baptist Church. She was also an active member of the choir and she sang first soprano so very well. She was an avid farmer who farmed alongside her husband in Bembo, Cheesefield, and even in Willowdean. She loved the land and cultivated it and fed many from the bounties of it. She was also an entrepreneur, always eager to turn her hand to assist her husband in providing for their family. The family enjoyed many Christmases and New Year's dinners together, and when we met, we shared memories of past dinners and reminisced of the good times we had enjoyed. How can we forget to mention her culinary skills in preparing those finger-licking meals? And let's not forget, no one could outdo her with her famous sweet potato pudding, especially when prepared the old-fashioned way taught by her mother. Hella bottom, hella top. Hallelujah in the middle. Laughter would fill the backyard as we ate together and the, with the immediate family, as well as the surrounding neighbors and friends. She and her husband opened the doors of their home to family and friends alike. Some spent days, some a few weeks, others months, and some spent years. 
She extended her support to anyone she could. And she was always giving sound advice to anyone who would take the time to listen. Her husband, Kenneth, never said no to anyone who asked him for help. If someone had asked for financial assistance and he didn't have the money to give, he would borrow from her because he knew she always had something stashed away for a rainy day. Scientists have proven that elephants have incredible memories. They have said that ele elephants can remember experiences from when they were a baby calf. Jean had the memory of an elephant. It often amazed us when she would recall stories or occurrences that happened many, many years ago. And we will surely miss the length and breadth of her memory bank. December 2019 was not as cheerful as in previous years as Jean was in the hospital recovering from neck surgery. During the three months recovery at the Kingston Public Hospital, Kenneth would visit her almost daily. He even cooked her, one of her favorite dishes of renta yam with ackee and saltfish, as he knew how much she would enjoy that meal. And that day, she surely did enjoy that meal. He was a constant support to her, and this continued when she later went to Mona Rehab in 2020. Her illness was very difficult for family members, especially for her husband, Kenneth. And he would often cry when he saw her in pain as he was unable to bring her any relief. We would cherish the memories of our last Christmas together when we cooked and went to Mona to share our dinner with his beloved Paddy. Although it was not as cheerful as previous Christmases, we appreciated the time we spent together as a family. Jean continued to fight the spinal cord injury she suffered as a result of the surgery performed in November of 2019. We thank God for the many angels he sent to attend to her needs, day and night. We are so very thankful to those caregivers and neighbors that were always willing to assist when called upon, so lovingly and tirelessly. You know who you are, and we will forever be thankful and grateful for all that you have done. She fought hard and continued to cling to the hope of one day being able to walk again. However, despite her best efforts, she lost the fight on February 3rd, 2023, when she peacefully passed away at the Spanish Town Hospital as her daughter Suzanne held her hand as she took her last breath. Though we mourn her loss, we can take comfort in knowing that her legacy lives on. She touched so many with her kindness, generosity, and compassion. She will be deeply missed by so many, but her memory will always be a source of inspiration for us all. Jean, thank you for being part of our lives. You fulfilled your purpose. You taught us well, for which we are forever thankful. We're all going to miss you, and we will cherish our shared memories. You are more precious than gold. Sleep on, Jeannie girl, and we look forward to greeting you on that great resurrection morning. Proverbs 31, 28 to 29 says, Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently but you surpassed them all. Mommy, you have been a blessing in our lives, and we will cherish you in our hearts, and we love you always.
reunion very soon. and very soon we are going to see the king recently I had the opportunity to share with the church And one of the things that struck me is how in the blink of an eye things change. Have you ever been somewhere only to go back and realize that the change that you see in the time that you have been away is so phenomenal that you wonder how old you are and how many years would have passed. Coming out of the COVID lockdown, you see some children that when you saw them before the lockdown, they were barely above your waist. And after two years, they come to you and introduce themselves and you are unfamiliar with who they are because you have to be looking up to see if you can recognize them only for them to tell you, you don't remember me? I am so and so. And for a brief moment, you begin to calculate when you were born and how many years would have passed. It is against that background I want to share with you. As I extend condolence to the family of the Browns, relatives and friends who are here to mourn the passing of our dear sister Brown. And I reflect with you this afternoon, this morning, sorry, on change, change. And for a brief moment, I'll read for you Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'm going to be reading from verse 9 through to verse 15. What gain has the, work, the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in man's heart. Yet, so that he, he not, cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God has, whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. The word of the Lord. Many of us would be familiar with the first part of Ecclesiastes that deals with time and season, 
planting and reaping, embracing and refraining from embrace, we would have been familiar with the narrative that is attributed to Solomon that speaks to the changes that occur in life. So almost everything in life changes. Some naturally, while others must be acted upon for change to take place. Some changes are gradual and take years, while others are instantaneous and in the split of a second, change will happen. There are easy changes and there are hard changes. But one thing Solomon put forward in Ecclesiastes is this, that even though change is consistent, so many of us fear change. For one reason or another, we fear change. We want to remain, many of us, in a particular state for as long as we would be given the chance. Some of us don't want to get older than we are at 16. And some of us have been 16 for 16 years because we don't want to change. And some of us are still trying to fit in a dress that we used to fit in before we could fit in the dress. So we blame the washing machine. We blame the sun for altering the size of the dress because we resist change. But the writer says about change that change is ceaseless and consistent. One of the things you can depend on in life is that things will change. Whether we like it or not, whether we are ready for it or not, whether we prepare for it or not, things will change. And things are changing around us, whether we are ready or not. It is happening. It is happening. Children are growing up and they are leaving. We are losing the ability to recover from our activities. Once upon a time, we, we could spend all night out and come home and no matter what hours we reach home, we could jump up and bounce back and be at work in the morning. Now, if eight o'clock passes and we are not asleep, we can't make it through the day. It is ceaseless and it is consistent. He says about change, change is inclusive and universal. He points out that every area of life will experience change. From the point of nature to our own physical and mental and emotional existence, change is occurring. There is no part of your life that's immune from change. And when I reflected, many of us can go back in our minds to those times when we had all our family members around us. The Sunday dinners, the laughing, the fighting, the times we were provoking each other. And some of us can remember those times when we were young, we wish we were 
grown-ups and we wish we didn't have so many siblings we wanted our own room we wanted our independence but now we grow up and we have our independence we want our siblings back we want those days when we were running up and down and feel free and that our parents would worry about everything and we would have no care in the world It's amazing. The same people that you used to quarrel with when you were growing up, and no distance has caused separation, we are longing to meet up again. Change is taking place in every area of our lives. People grow apart, people die, people hurt. People miss each other. And what I found interesting is that the writer points out not only how change is ceaseless and consistent, not only how change is inclusive and universal, but he says change is designed by God. God created a universe to change. He created everything with the ability to change. He created life and existence not to remain the same, but the same, but to experience transition, movement, and adjustments. And since God is in charge of change, change has a purpose. We may not like it, we may not even embrace it while it is happening, but God ensures that change takes place in everything and in everyone. And there's a reason for that. Anything that does not change does not serve a purpose. And if it did serve a purpose in the beginning, eventually its purpose will no longer be necessary. How many of you, when you were growing up, saw some nice big buildings and you thought to yourself, man, I wish I could get into one of those buildings, whether or not it was an entertainment place or a big house. We thought to ourselves, aren't those places amazing? It must be lovely to get inside one. A couple of years later, those same places you look at, dilapidated, run down, and you wonder, oh my God, look at that now. I remember a couple of years ago I went home with my sister and we went into the house and I looked at my sister and my sister looked at me and I knew what she was thinking and I said to her did the house shrink I remember when I was growing up the rooms were larger the house was bigger the places that we play seem to have been much wider than they are now. I don't know if it has happened to you, but you have gone back to a place that you're used to. And when you go, you look at the place and you ask. It's not the same. Because I honestly remember on those Saturdays when we used to have to clean the hall. It takes us the whole day to clean the hall. And I went back home and two steps and I covered the hall and I said, no, it's not the hall I remember. But what it says to me is that change moves things. Change affects things in a way that reminds us that you cannot depend on anything in life but a God who never changes. You can't 
put all your eggs in one basket for somehow the basket will no longer be able to carry the contents that you have placed in it. And while we are in this life, so many of us put roots down on soil that is moving, on places that are not stable, and we end up facing crises in life that we no longer have the resources to manage because we have put our confidence in material things. You know, when I visited Sister Brown and interacted with the Brown family, you in my pastoral sojourn here, I realized something that the Browns have a very powerful family connection. They are there for each other and they are there with each other. And one of the things I admired that these children will drop almost anything and everything to come to the aid of their parents. Nowadays, it seems as if children will drop their parents and go to the aid of everything else. But to find that connection still there, it's refreshing to know and to hear Sister Brown speak about how her children are there with her, are there for her, even though she was in a state where she was not be able to move as she would like, Sister Brown was still vibrant, lively, and enthused because she knew her children loved her. You see, when you put your confidence in relationship, in connection, in unity with each other, that is stable, that is consistent. No matter what changes around us, being united, being connected with family, being connected with God is a precious gift that we should not take for granted. So the writer says, change is inevitable. Change is ceaseless. Change is consistent. Change is inclusive and universal. But within change, God is the one who manages change. And because God manage, manages change, we can be certain that change is there to remind us what not to trust in, but also what to trust in. So I am encouraging you, don't be fooled by the thoughts and arguments of our age. Don't put your trust in chariots. Don't put your trust in horses, but put your trust in a God who creates a world to remind us that we need to seek him. You know how the writer puts it? God has put the thoughts of himself into the hearts of men. God has allowed this notion of a changing world to remind us that we need to seek something more permanent, something more consistent than the things of this world. I told a story here some years ago that when I was growing up, there was a number of us children in the house. So we did not know what it was to gain or to have our parents buy a name brand shoes for us. But I remember one summer, my mother went overseas and carried back a sneakers, name brand, white and pretty. And I said, you know what? These shoes I'm not going to wear. Just any and anywhere. I'm going to save it for the right occasion. And I saved it from the summer till the next summer. When our school had a fear. And I took up the sneakers. Dressed and ready now to wear. And put my foot in it. It went right through. I 
I still held on to the, the side of the, the sneakers that were now at my knee and the bottom of the sneakers was still down where my foot was. And this was the first time I was about to wear the shoes. It was still white. It was still beautiful. But now it had no use. It taught me a very powerful lesson. That even when you don't see it, change is taking place. And if you don't use what you have and manage what you have effectively, you're going to lose it. Can I suggest that don't take family for granted. Don't take each other for granted. Change will occur and rip us apart at any moment and you may not even realize it until it's too late. Because God manage, manages change. God is telling us, make the most of every moment and every season. Take the opportunity to enjoy life to its fullest. Not in rebellion against God, but in embracing God and God's will for your life in this moment. Because changes will come. But finally, I want to leave one last thought with you. So because change is ceaseless and consistent because change is inclusive and universal and change carries purpose. It also means that change is structured. Change doesn't happen meaninglessly. There is a pattern to the change. Whatsoever you sow, you reap. Whatsoever you do, you get back. However you live, it carries the returning effect on your life. Change has purpose. There's a time to sow and a time to reap, a time to give and a time to lose. What I find interesting is the sequence in which the writer places the change. It changes from one positive to what you could consider negative but it changes back to positive there is a cycle to the change so it tells me that in this notion of change God has built an awareness that we must be humble and sincere in the life we live because one day you are up the next day you're down. One day you have almost everything you need. One day you will need everything. Life then calls us that in this moment of pain, one day you will weep, but another you will rejoice. One day you will hurt, but another day you will gain healing. The writer says, weeping will endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And I'm saying to the family, even though you may not be able to see it now or experience it now, your pain will change. You won't forget your loved one, but the pain will change. You won't lose sight of their importance to your life, but change will come. And I'm encouraging us, let us live each moment knowing that the next moment will bring a structured change that will move us. For my God has created life so beautifully that one moment you are in darkness, the next you are in light. What should we say about this? It means that the whole duty of man is to serve a God who can help us manage all the changes that life will bring. If you look at me, you wouldn't know this, but when I was young, I used to wear my hair long. Yes, I, I could pin it up in one. 
until one day I realized that there was nothing on top. There was hair around the side. I even said to a barber, because you are not trimming the top, can I get a discount? He said no. So I decided if it is going to cost me the full amount to trim the whole hair, I'm going to get rid of the ones that I have to trim. And if you can't find, fight change, allow God to change your heart to embrace the change and lean into the change. Because can I tell you, since me cut off me here, me look better. <laughs> Hallelujah. I see you agree with me. If you don't agree with me, don't tell me. But even though change may be disruptive and hurtful, even though change may be unexpected and sometimes even unappreciated God can help us to manage the change to navigate the change in such a way instead of being destructive the change can leave us in a better state sometimes our greatest joy stems from our most painful experience I pray that as we manage this change, a time of hurt and a time of pain, we will experience the peace and comfort of God that is the God who manages change and leads us to finding hope in the midst of life changes. God bless you. During this moment, we invite the rest of the congregation to stand and the members of the immediate family remain seated as we go into a time of intercession for the family. Thank you, Jesus. God who watches over us. God whose comfort and presence remain with us in all our experiences. The God whose power can calm the raging storm. Draw near to us. Draw near to us in our pain, reminds us, reminding us, O oh God, that you are a God of peace. A God of comfort and a God of courage. The one who will endure us with all we need to traverse this rocky ground of life's ups and downs. We bring the Browns family before you. You know them individually and you know the family collectively as a unit. You know where they are mourning. You know where they are hurting. You know where the moments are difficult for them. So comforting God. Reassuring God. God stand with them for you are a peace which passes all understanding your peace is beyond the peace that this world gives because in the midst of crisis you are our rock and our shelter so comfort the members of the family immediate and extended who must go through another day without their loved one. 
we thank you for her life and her witness. And as a body here in this sanctuary, help us to release her to you and in your care. Help us to know that she is in a better place with you than she could have ever been with us. Lead them into a greater knowledge, O oh God, that you are always watching over them and never leaving them, no matter where they go or what they may face. Comforting God, let your benediction rest on them, God the Father. Let your benediction rest upon them, God the Son. Let your benediction rest upon them, God the Holy Spirit. Forever three in one. Amen. amen. And amen. words to the family now as we close in, in, in our recession the platform that is a choir you will go down first and the casket will follow then the family members will go behind the casket and then the congregation follows so the direction is that the, the choir will go down the aisle and will come back up with the casket and then we go out. All right, so we go down, so you'll follow us as we go. Our closing aim, our recessional aim is, I'll fly away some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away.
We will join you now to the next service. One. We will not end this one with benediction. We will move on to the next service as the service will continue. God bless you. Safe journey.